Welcome to Real Christianity with Mosley Collins, a weekly call to a deeper walk with God. Here's Mosley. A knock on your door at midnight. Have you ever gotten a knock on your door at midnight? Or even a phone call in the middle of the night? It startles you. Who could that be? What's wrong? If your doorbell rings at midnight, it's frightening. You're not prepared. You're not dressed. Your hair is not combed. You have no shoes on your feet. You're not alert. If you're a woman, you have no makeup on. You know, my wife, when she wake up, wakes up in the morning, she says, don't look at me. I think she's beautiful at that time, but she doesn't. She actually is beautiful, but she has no makeup on, so she feels unprepared. You know, during the day, we're sober, we're prepared. We've got our game face on, we've got our makeup on. But during the night, that's when things happen. If someone's going to be drunk, it's probably going to be in the night. If someone's going to cheat on their husband or their wife, chances are it's going to be in the night. You know, you could almost say you need to see someone in the day and during the night to judge their character. Because it's during the night when we think no one is looking, not even God, that's the time we do the things we should not do. Now, Jesus said, I am come a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not live in darkness. And that's John 12, 46. But Jesus also said, Light has come into the world, but people love darkness because their deeds are evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be plainly seen that what he does, he does through God. And that's John 3.19. So sometimes we hope that God doesn't see some of the things we have done in the dark. God, of course, does see. Proverbs 15.3 says, For the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. The eyes of the Lord, they're not just in some places. The eyes of the Lord see not just in the daytime, not just when we are on our best behavior, but the eyes of the Lord see in every place. Proverbs 5.21 says, For the ways of a person are before the eyes of the Lord, and he considers all he does. Now, before we go too far in this message, I think it's important to remember how God feels about us. The Bible says in John 3.16, God loved people of the world so much that he gave his only son, Jesus, so that whoever believes in Jesus would not perish, but would have eternal life. God sent Jesus not because he was angry or disgusted or bored or spiteful or because he wanted to hurt us or condemn us. He sent Jesus because he loved us. He loves you and me. He loves your great-grandfather on your mother's side. And he's, he loves your great-great-grandson, not even born yet. He loves your best friend and your worst enemy. He loves your boss and the kid who mows your lawn. Because God is love. And that's from 1 John 4, 8. Now, God made the ultimate sacrifice because he wanted one thing above all else. He wanted you and me and all the peoples of the world to receive his gift and his gift is eternal life in heaven. But some of us will not receive eternal life, not because God doesn't want to give it to us, but because we have not received Jesus as our Savior and as our Lord, we have not put him first in our life. Now the Bible says there's a day coming when we will all stand before God and be judged. God wants everyone to live with him in heaven because he loves us. But some people will not be allowed in, and this will break God's heart. Let me share with you what the Bible says about that day, which is coming when everyone, including you and me, will stand before God. It's Revelations, beginning at verse chapter 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. 
And the dead were judged according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. And any one whose name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, the passage I have just read to you out of Revelations is not a parable. In this, the Bible is actually telling us what will come. And what will come is someday all of us, great and small, will stand before God. The people that you see on the magazine covers and see on television or in the movies, the people that are famous, the people that are rich, and the people you've never heard of, the great and the small, will all stand before God and be judged. Now this passage tells us there are two sets of books. The first set of books is a set of books that has all the events of your life and my life. And I sometimes think of it as not really a book, but maybe a giant TV screen, and I'll be standing there with God, and we're going to watch my life. And there are going to be some wonderful moments and some proud moments, and I'm going to be in some places when I watch the movie of my life, very proud of some of the noble and selfless things I've done to help others. But there's also going to be other things, if my life is recorded accurately, which it will be. There'll be things that I'm not proud of, and I'll be probably covering my eyes and thinking, wow, I wish that wasn't there. I wish that wasn't up on the screen. I wish God wasn't seeing this. And after my life has been played out on that screen, I'm going to know for a fact that I'm not perfect, that I have sinned, and that I'm really not fit to spend eternity in heaven with God. And the same will be true of your life, because no one has been perfect. No one has met the standard for heaven. And so you and I will be standing there, and we'll be looking down at the ground thinking, wow, this is not good. And then we'll remember that there's one other book that's going to be open called the Lamb's Book of Life. And if your name is written in that book, no matter what was on the other movie screen, if your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you're in. And so let's just say your name is Bill Johnson. And in my imagination, I imagine an angel calling out, check the Lamb's Book of Life. See if Bill Johnson is written there. And another angel will be going through the book, Let's see, James, Jakes, Jensen. Yeah, here it is, Bill Johnson. Yes, and that'll be the happiest moment of your life to know that your name is written there, that you are going to receive eternal life in heaven with God. Now, how do you get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? You get it there by receiving Jesus as your Savior and then by keeping his commandments. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 4, If someone says, I belong to God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and does not live in the truth. But those who obey God's word really do love him. And that is the way to know whether or not we live in him. In other words, the Bible says we have to obey his commandments if we're truly his. Now, here's the mistake we make as Christians. We think that being a Christian is kind of like registering as a Democrat or a Republican. Now, once you, re- once you register as a Democrat, you can always vote Democrat. And once you register as a Republican, you can always vote Republican. It doesn't really matter whether or not you've done anything to live as a Republican should live or as a Democrat should live according to the beliefs of your party. If someone says, I'm a Christian, but doesn't live like it, then in God's eyes, he's not. Being a Christian requires more than just registering once. It requires a daily walk with Jesus. I once heard someone say, if you were on trial for being a Christian, someone who was a follower of Jesus, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Now, sadly, for many of us, there would not be enough evidence in our lives to convict us of being a true Christian. Let me read you from Matthew 
chapter 7, beginning verse 21, something Jesus said, which we need to really take to heart, because this is, has to do with that knock on the door at midnight. Jesus said, Not all people who sound religious are really godly. They may refer to me as Lord, but they still won't enter the kingdom of heaven. The decisive issue is whether they obey my Father in heaven. On judgment day, many will tell me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Go away. The things you did were unauthorized. So here Jesus is telling us very clearly, it's not enough just to call ourselves Christians. We have to live as Christians. Now, Jesus told a parable of the ten virgins to further illustrate his point. And let me read that to you. Jesus said in Matthew 25, The kingdom of heaven shall be like to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. And those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their lamps with them. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered and saying, No, lest there should be not enough for us and you. But go, rather, to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while the foolish virgins went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the five foolish virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Now in this parable, the virgins are you and I. The virgins are the Christians of the world, people who call themselves Christians. And the bridegroom, of course, is Christ. And as you remember, there were two types of virgins in this parable. There was the wise who had oil with their lamps and the foolish who had none. And there were two different outcomes. The Christians... Who the wise virgins who had the oil were able to light their lamps and were able to go into heaven with Christ. And the ones who had no oil were not able to. And they, as they tried to go and get oil, if it was too late and the door was shut. And the oil stands for a true Christian character. The oil stands for living the Christian life. And we have to have enough oil in our lamps. We have to have enough oil in our lamps to live as Christians every day. If our oil runs out, if our Christianity runs out, if we're just pretending to be Christians, if we're not actually living every day as God calls us to live, then we have no oil in our lamps. And if Jesus returns at that time, we're going to be shut out of heaven. We hope that you're being blessed and encouraged by today's message from Mosley Collins. He's available to speak at your church, Christian group, or Bible study. There's never a charge for his ministry. If you have questions about today's subject or you wish to invite Mosley to come speak to your group, you can reach him at 916-444-4444. You can also request a copy of today's message. Just dial all fours for help or more information. Now let's get back to today's message. Now is Jesus said in the parable of the ten virgins, we don't know the day and we don't know the hour when he's returning. But one thing is certain, we're all going to face God and we're all going to face eternity. Now there's two ways we may end up facing God or eternity. And the first is when we die. Three years ago, a dear friend of mine, who was only 48 years of age, was driving home in a car. He lived in a rural area of Florida where the roads go on for mile after mile past cattle farms. The roads have very little shoulders, and sometimes the shoulder will drop off. The road will drop off to a shoulder that's like six inches below the road. Now, by mistake, as he, my friend drove along, he let his car drive off the road onto a deep shoulder, and he tried to correct it. He tried to turn back onto the road. 
and his car flipped, and he was killed right there on that road. Within 20 seconds of driving off the road, he was dead. In such a case as this, there is no time. One second, we're fighting with the car, and the next second, we're dead. There's no time to get right with God. There's no time to ask for forgiveness. There's no time to pray the sinner's prayer or ask Jesus into our heart. Some of us will face God that quickly, and that's why we need to be ready. We need to be like the five wise virgins. We need oil in our lamps. We need Jesus in our heart right now and every day and every night. Now, the second way we may face eternity is when Jesus returns. The Bible teaches that Jesus will return. And in fact, Jesus himself said many times in the Bible he would return. Let me read you one such passage. Jesus said, For I, the Son of Man, will come in the glory of my Father and with his angels, and I will judge all people according to their deeds. Matthew 16, 27. Now, knowing that we must face eternity, knowing we must face God, and that some people are going to be allowed to go to heaven and some are not, what are the things that might keep us out of heaven? Because this is, and this is such a very important question, because, you know, this world that we live in, this life, this world doesn't have the true riches. The true riches are in eternity. This life is going to be over in a blink. I'm 58 years old, and it seems like yesterday I was 19. And in a blink of an eye, I'll be 70, 80. I'll be at the end of my life. And the same is true of you. Eternity will go on forever. So it's critical that in this life we give some thought to what might keep us out of heaven. The first thing that will keep you out of heaven is not having Jesus as your Savior, not asking him to forgive your sins and come into your heart. Now, I'm going to share a prayer with you in a few minutes that will allow you to invite Jesus into your heart. And we'll be touching on that in just a second. But another thing that can keep us from heaven is how we treat the poor and the needy. Jesus elaborated on this in Matthew 26, verses 31 to 46. Let me read it to you. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his holy angels with him, he will sit on the throne of his glory, and all nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hands, but the goat on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when do we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. Then he will turn to those on his left hand and say, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And they will also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? And then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous to everlasting life. Now let's talk about this passage just for a minute. First of all, it's not a parable. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his holy angels with him. It's not, and it's also not if he will come, but when he will come. Now this 
passage makes it perfectly clear that we need to help the poor and the needy. A third thing that can keep you out of heaven is living an ungodly life. The Bible says in Galatians 5:19 through 21, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious, fornication, which is sex outside of marriage, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, jealousy, selfish ambition, dissensions, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So here the Bible is clearly telling us, if you live a life, a lifestyle of fornication, for example, which is sex outside of marriage, or of drunkenness, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. There are many people living today with their boyfriend or girlfriend, thinking they are Christians and going to heaven. And I know many people who believe that they are Christians, who are sleeping with their boyfriend and girlfriend. They're not getting married. They have chosen this as a lifestyle. And it's the lifestyle that the Bible calls fornication or sex outside of marriage. The Bible teaches that if you choose fornication or drunkenness as a lifestyle, you will not go to heaven. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, when I tell people these things or when I warn people these things, sometimes people say, oh, that's very narrow. That's too inconvenient. That's so old-fashioned. It's too narrow-minded. Do I sound narrow-minded? Consider what Jesus said. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many that go in there because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to eternal life. And there are few who find it. So the Bible is warning us to be ready for the knock at midnight. Are you ready? Here's a short prayer I will pray with you right now if you would pray with me. And if you're sincere, you'll, ask, it'll, you'll be asking Jesus into your heart. You can pray with me right now after me. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and be my Savior. Amen. That's a prayer that will put Jesus into your heart. Now, some people think that what I'm presenting here today is too restrictive and too inconvenient and that that's not the kind of God they believe in. You know, it really doesn't matter what kind of God we believe in. What really matters is what the Bible says and what is actually going to happen when we stand before God on Judgment Day. When we get the knock on the door, when our life is open, over, whether that knock comes at midnight or it comes in the morning, we have to be ready. We have to be ready to be found in Him. We've covered a lot of ground today. If you want to pray the prayer but you didn't quite get it or you need more help, I'm going to wait here in my office by the phone for a few minutes. You can call now or you can call later. And I'll do everything I can to help you. Thanks. I'm Mosley Collins, and this is Real Christianity. Thank you for joining us for Real Christianity. We hope you've been blessed and encouraged by today's message from Mosley Collins. Mosley lives with his family in the Sacramento area. He's available to teach at your church, Christian group, or Bible study. There is never a charge for his ministry. If you have questions about today's subject or you wish to invite Mosley to come speak to your group, you can reach him at 916-444-4444. 